quantitative traits are frequently under selection and they respond to that selection by evolving um, um, a lot as we just saw in the previous segment. Um, those responses are possible and happen because at least some fraction of the phenotypic variation on which selection is acting is heritable variation. So to that end, biologists often spend a lot of time estimating heritability. But what do those heritability estimates tell us, really? And what do they not tell us? Um, this subtle and important matter is poorly understood by members of the general public and even by professional biologists, so we need to come back through it one more time in hopes of helping you get a better sense of how to think about it uh, in both scientific and uh, social contexts. We're going to illustrate with um, a classic study from the 1940s and 50s by Klaus and Keck and Heise on yarrow, Achillea, a composite uh, plant that grows wild throughout California um, and other parts of, the, of North America. Um, and it was of interest to them, it attracted them because it, they found it growing at very different elevations in different parts of the state. And um, they noticed that plant height was highly variable um, every place um, they studied the plant and heritable in each environment. Um, and they did uh, to under sort out the uh, degree to which these differences, this variation in plant height and other traits, but we'll just focus on plant height here, um, to try to sort out the causes of that variation, they um, subdivided uh, plants and grew um, clonal um, chunks of a given genotype at actually three um, different elevations at um, a, a, at Mather, which is a Sierra Foothills site, a several thousand feet elevation, at Stanford, about a hundred feet above sea level, and also uh, at a tree line location at about 10,000 feet. Um, this great figure um, shows uh, just um, seven of their genotypes, just named A through G. Um, typical um, stalks grown at Stanford and at Mather. What they noticed is that all of the genotypes were shorter at higher elevations. Um, that's true in this uh, selection without um, exception. Every single genotype, all seven of them, is taller at Stanford, shorter at Mather. However, some plants that were relatively tall in one environment were relatively short in the other. So for example, look at E, which was the second tallest at Mather, nearly as tall as A, which was tallest in both environments. Um, all right, it was relatively tall here, um, relatively short. It was the third shortest um, at Stanford, and you can find many other examples like that. For example, B, which is short at Mather and tall um, at Stanford, and so on. So the genetic variance depends on the population's environment. The amount of variation and the identities of the taller and shorter phenotypes differ depending on where the plants are grown. That's G by E interaction. And likewise, and equivalently, the environmental variance depends on the population's genes. So the degree to which you would get variation at Mather or at Stanford would depend on which genotypes you um, included. So this situation dependence of variance components is called um, genotype by environment or G by E interaction. We've met it before, we're just coming at it again um, to try to nail down its meaning and its significance. Um, here's a, a figure not from your textbook, but from a book by Doug Fatuma, um, published by Sinauer and still in print. Um, and it shows using um, a classic experiment with um, bristle numbers in Drosophila larvae, um, how variation, genetic variation, 
can actually be created and destroyed by the environment, which, when you say it, sounds like an oxymoron. It's, it sounds like a nonsense statement. But in fact, it's true, and it's importantly true. So um, we're going to introduce a bit of jargon. The norm of reaction is the name um, historically given um, to a graph that describes how a given genotype responds phenotypically to different states of the environment. And this um, figure on the right shows um, norms of reaction in four different displays, which we'll walk through. A, panel A here, shows um, two hypothetical genotypes which are uh, modeled on these real data in panel B from this uh, Drosophila crystal number experiment. Um, two genotypes um, that produce different phenotypes at different temperatures. So here we have an actual um, environmental variable temperature to which um, bristle number is known to respond. It's the temperature at, of the incubator where you grow the larval Drosophila. Okay, so in this um, case, genotypes called G1 and G2, that's what those little numbers um, say. If you look closely on the uh, slides, you'll be able to read this if you can't in the video. Um, so they, both genotypes produce different bristle numbers. The phenotype here on the y-axis is, in fact, bristle number. All right, and so at higher temperatures, the larvae produce, on average, uh, fewer bristles, and both genotypes do that. However, genotype 1 always produces two more bristles on average at any given temperature than does genotype 2. All right, so the phenotypes respond to temperature, but they always have the same difference between them. In any given environment, genotype 1 is different from genotype 2, and the difference is it makes, on average, two more bristles. All right, so that's a response to the environment. It's a non-trivial norm of reaction for both genotypes. But there's no G by E interaction because the difference between the genotypes does not depend on the environment. In B, as I said, we have real norms of reaction for 10 different inbred Drosophila genotypes that were raised at different temperatures on uh, which all of these cases, real and imagined, are modeled. Um, and here there's a lot of genotype by environment interaction because um, some genotypes um, behave like those in panel A. Um, that's this one here, which is the model for both of them, um, being always more bristles at lower temperatures, but others go the other way or have the highest number or the lowest number at intermediate um, temperatures and so on. So they're all over the place. There's a lot of genotype by environment interaction because how different genotypes respond differently to states of the environment. All right. C now takes, C and D take apart how changing the environment can actually create um, and destroy uh, genotypic interaction. These show um, the di distribution of bristle numbers for a population containing two of the genotypes from the actual experiment shown in panel B when raised at low to middling temperatures. Um, so in C, um, raised at this range of environmental temperatures centered around 19 or 20 um, degrees um, Celsius, the norms are completely separated, right? So genotype 1 in this panel C produces this distribution shown as a bell-shaped normal distribution of average bristle numbers um, on its side. You have to realize this, this is a, distri a distribution on its side on this scale of bristle numbers. All right, and so genotype 1 is making this lowish number of bristles which has some variation, but not much. Genotype 2 um, is at this 
temperature um, inclined to make a lot of bristles, it also makes a normalish distribution of average bristle numbers that's higher and completely distinct from the distribution made by genotype 2. So here there would be a lot of additive genetic variance and high heritability of bristle number. In this environment, the environment of panel C, that is if we raise them at this temperature, we can just look at the larvae, count their bristles, and tell are they genotype 1 or genotype 2. So obviously if we were to select for higher or lower bristle numbers, we would change the relative um, proportion of those two genotypes um, in that population, in that environment. It would be a piece of cake. We have a lot of genetic variants, high heritability. Um, the population could evolve. But what about D, right, which is the same population of genes, the same two genotypes, let's say, in initially equal frequency, but we just change the temperature to this higher temperature around 24 or 5 degrees, diabolically chosen to be centered on a place where the two norms of reaction cross, which is to say where there's no average uh, difference in bristle number made by the two genotypes. So we grow them there, um, project over to the y-axis, and look, we have two normal distributions of bristle number with the same mean, slightly different variances, so you can see the, them, but you could select till you were blue in the face for higher and lower bristle numbers, and you wouldn't change the genetic composition of the population, and you wouldn't get a, an evolutionary response to selection. The, num the bristle number wouldn't change because you hadn't changed the genotypes. Okay, you would just, the population would sit there. So no additive genetic variation, no heritability. So notice what's happened. We can create genetic variation by changing this population of panel D to the environment of panel C, or we can destroy it by moving the population from this environment to that um, to, to, from the panel C environment to the panel D environment and remove the genetic variation. We haven't changed the genes, we've changed the environment, but we've created and destroyed genetic variation. And the converse is also possible. So the upshot is that the heritability of a trait isn't a property of the trait. It's a property of the trait for a given population, which is to say a given gene pool, um, in a given environment, and it can't be extrapolated to another population in another environment, or even the same population in a different environment, um, right? or a different population in the same environment. Um, all those are equivalent um, impossibilities. In the Clausenkeck and Heise experiment, height was highly heritable within each of these environments. The plants differ, and they differ because of their genotypes, okay? So you could select for plant height in either of these environments and get a big response. Lots of the variation was heritable. But the height in each environment was a poor predictor of height in the other environment in two different ways. Um, the relative heights differed between the environments, and all of the genotypes, all of them, grew taller at Stanford than they did at Mather. So notice, you couldn't say, um, well, um, we know this trait is highly heritable, plant height. Um, we've proved that at Stanford and or we've proved it at Mather. Therefore, the large mean difference between the phenotype in these um, two populations must be due, at least in part, to genes. Sounds reasonable. Most everybody would nod their head and say, yep, must be true. The trait's heritable, so a lot of the difference must be due to genes. But because you know exactly what's going on here, that there are these same seven genotypes in the same relative proportions in these two environments, you know it isn't true. In fact, it's completely false. The difference is entirely um, environmental. So um, 
right? To say it another way, the differences within the populations largely determined by genes, but with different outcomes um, in each environment. And this large average difference between the populations is entirely non-genetic. Okay, so that brings us um, to our formal treatment of quantitative traits. You meditate on that example, and if you understand it, you've made, again, another big leap in your own education as a biologist. Good for you. Um, see you soon at the next topics, which will be even more fun.